put your hands together for Father Peter McCurry. Tomorrow. Thanks for coming. Peter, thanks for coming tonight. Not at all, pleasure. No, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I know you've been waiting a while back there, so thanks a million uh, for your patience as well. Do you know, just before we get into your activism and the work you did, you're from Nori, but how come you ended up um, joining a religious order? Was that in your family, or how did that come about? Yeah, I went to a Jesuit boarding school down in Clongos. My father had been there, so he sent all the... the, the, uh, the three boys that he had, he sent them to uh, to Clongos. So I was there from 12 years to 18. So when I was thinking of what I was going to do with my life and I was thinking of becoming a priest, joining the Jesuits was the obvious the obvious choice since they were the only ones I knew. Yeah. Do you know when you came to Dublin and Ballymun in the 1970s, can you describe to us what it was like at the time? When I first went to the inner city of Dublin in the 1970s. I was there for six years. And uh, I was absolutely horrified. The conditions that people lived in were appalling. Much of the housing was old tenement buildings from the 1800s, divided into flats for families. There was uh, no soundproofing between flats. We had a flat on the top floor. We could listen to the news on the television in the flat below us perfectly clearly. The place was crawling with rats. The rats were the size of little kittens and immune from every poison that had ever been invented. On the top floor all night long, every night, you listen to the rats running along the ceiling, fighting with one another, squealing, running, occasionally eating through the electric wires, all the lights would go out. That wasn't too bad. But on the ground floor, parents would tell you of waking up in the morning and finding a rat on the baby's cot. So, and for some of those houses, there was one outside toilet for the eight families. Uh, so the housing was absolutely awful. The unemployment rate was about 80% oh. because people in the north inner city traditionally worked on the docks beside them loading and unloading ships. And then when containerization came in and the cranes did all the lifting, they lost their jobs. So a young person growing up in the inner city never expected uh, to ever get any sort of decent job. And if they didn't expect to get a job, what's the point in staying in school? Yeah. So the issue that hit us very quickly when we went there well, wasn't homelessness. It was young people leaving school early. They were leaving school at the very latest by the age of 12, hanging around the streets all day long. Parents, mostly unemployed, couldn't give them any money. So what were they doing? A little bit of robbing. Yeah. And by the time they got to 16 and 17, they were doing an awful lot of robbing and they were going to jail. So... Well, that's what horrified me. And what shocked me even more was the fact I had been living in Dublin for many years and I was totally unaware of the awful conditions that some people in our capital city, only a couple of hundred yards from O'Connell Street, had to live in. Was homelessness a big deal back then? No, it wasn't a big deal at all. Uh, back then, there were about a thousand homeless people in Ireland, uh, mostly elderly men with a drink problem. Many of them had spent their lives working in England. He had retired or lost their jobs, came back to Ireland, had lost contact with family, knew nobody here, and they just went from town to town. Uh, and they were highly respected. Mm. They were looked after. Uh, there wasn't the same stigma that attached to homelessness as there is today. Is, so it was a much smaller problem then yeah. than it is today. Is it amazing that back then we had nothing in this country? People were barely being fed, but we had less numbers in homelessness. Now we're one of the wealthiest co countries, not just in Europe, but globally. And we've, how many people are on Well, we've 12,000 registered as homeless, but at least another 12,000 homeless who aren't registered. They're sofa surfing, or they're staying with friends or whatever. So we have at least 25,000 homeless people at the moment in Ireland, yes. probably even more than that. Well, can you tell us about the genesis of your first hostel? How did that come about? And, yeah. yeah, I was working in the inner city. So we were working with young people who had left school early. So we, we had opened a youth club for all the kids in the area. We had a craft centre going that could make lovely crafts. They were able to sell them, make a few bob legitimately. And we were able to employ some of the young people making their crafts. And did that for a few years. And then I came across a young guy sleeping on the street, nine years of age. 
So we said, look, we have a youth club for the young people of the area. We have a craft center. We have employment schemes. Let's get a house and open a little hostel. So we did. We got a house. We took in six boys up to the age of 16. There were no girls on the streets back in the 1970s. That only came later. So we took in six boys up to the age of 16. And uh, I went to the government. I said, will you, will you support us? They didn't want to know. They said, we don't agree with this hostel. We don't see the point of this hostel. We're not going to support you. These were young people who were living on the street. And of course, they were doing a bit of robbing. They were robbing for their food, robbing for their clothes. And so the authorities considered them little delinquents who should be punished and locked up. And here was me giving them a place to live, buying them clothes, bringing them on holidays. I was seen as part of the problem, not part of the solution. <laughs> So anyway, I ran that for a few years. Uh, and then the young people were leaving that at 16, 16 and a half. And they were going back in the streets because there was nothing for them. So he said, look, we better open a hostel for the over 16s. So they demolished the whole inner city at that stage. And I had moved to Ballymun in 1980. So I asked Dublin City Council for a premises to use as a hostel for the over 16s. And to my surprise and to their to their regret ever since, they gave us a three-bedroom flat in Ballymun, in the old flats. So we opened that as a hostel and the numbers grew and grew and grew. We often had 15, 16 teenagers living in a three-bedroom flat. So we had to get another house in town uh, to take the overflow. And then the, uh, the drug problem came in and we had young people, 14, 15, coming to us injecting heroin. So we had to open a detox centre. And then we had to open a drug-free hostel for the young people who had finished the detox. Then the Child Care Act came in and we had to separate out the over-18s from the under-18s, so we had to open more hostels. And that's the way it went for a long time. No big plan. We just went from year to year. What have we got to do next? Uh, today we run 25 hostels all over Dublin and some in Kildare. Almost a 1,000 homeless people every night in the hostels. We have over a thousand apartments where we can give a homeless person the key of the door and say, this is yours for the rest of your life. You never, ever have to be homeless again. We have five drug and alcohol treatment centers. We have a drop-in center in the city center. And we actually run two small schools. We have two small schools for young people who've been expelled from mainstream education or have simply dropped out. And the idea of that is that many of the homeless people we deal with left school early course, if you leave school early, your risk of becoming homeless is pretty high because you're going to be hanging around the streets all the time. You're going to be doing a bit of robbing, maybe a bit of drugs. So uh, we opened these schools to try and keep these young people in school. And it's very successful, 95% stay uh, in the hope that we can prevent them or some of them anyway, becoming homeless in the, in the, in the future. Isn't, yeah. it, isn't it kind of sad, really, that, you know, with any kind of community development organisation, you're working to make yourself redundant. You're trying to solve a problem so that you're not needed. And that's where you start up. But over the years, you've actually had to expand your services because the problem is getting worse decade on decade. Isn't that kind of sad, really? It is. Our, our, our CEO, he's been CEO for uh, the last 18 years. He's done a fantastic job in running what is now a pretty big organization. Mm. But anyway, he tells a story. He was walking along with his little five-year-old son and they saw a guy begging. And his son says to him, Dad, what's that man doing sitting down there? And his father said, oh, he's homeless. And his son looks at, Pat, Pat his name is, looks at his dad and he says, you work with homeless, don't you? And Pat said, yes. Well, you're not doing a very good job, are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it feels sometimes. Yeah. You know, yeah. people say, God, you've done a great job. I say, look, when I started, there were a thousand homeless people in Ireland. Now there's about 12,000 registered. That's not much of an achievement, is it? Yeah. You know, we were chatting before uh, backstage about um, the amount of people that you're helping and you, you run, you're part of Housing Trust, uh, Housing mm -hmm. First as well. We were ch just chatting how maybe the general population um, look at maybe the, the Mac Ferry Trust giving houses to people out on the streets and we've kids and stuff then that maybe uh, and, and families being thrown out on the streets basically at the moment because of the evictions. Mm -hmm. How are you dealing with that at the moment, Peter? Well, the majority of people becoming homeless today yeah. are being evicted from the private rental sector. There's a stigma attached to addiction, to uh, homelessness. Mm. 
because the only homeless people who are visible are the ones on the street. Yeah. And very often they do have a drug problem uh, or a mental health problem or both. And that shapes the perception of the public that homeless people have a drug problem or have an addiction of some sort or a mental health problem. But the majority of homeless people don't have that. Yeah. The majority of homeless people only have one problem. They don't have enough money to be able to go out and get themselves alternative accommodation when they get evicted from the private rented accommodation. So we need to change that perception. Almost anybody can become homeless today. You know, if you're renting accommodation, the landlord can put you out at any time, give you a few months' notice to put you out. If you lose your job and you're renting accommodation, you're not going to be able to pay the rent. You may very well be evicted and there may be nowhere for you to go. You may end up homeless. So I think we need to change that perception. Almost anybody today can become homeless. As you know, there are many adults, 20s and 30s and 40s, still living with their parents involuntarily because they cannot find somewhere to live. There are thousands of young people who are sofa surfing who don't want to register as homeless and are depending on their friends. Uh, so... Homelessness covers almost every social group now at the moment. It's not, it's not just a question of uh, people with addictions or mental health. How does it actually work? You know, if you're, you're housing somebody that's homeless, how does it work? Mm -hmm. What's the process of it? Well, first, uh, we work very closely with the local authority uh, because they provide us with most of the apartments that we, we use or they give us the money to get the apartments that we use. Uh, so the person has to be on the, uh, the homeless housing list with the local authority and depending on how far up the homeless housing list they are, uh, the ho local authority can refer them to us and we will, and we will house them. So it depends. We're a little bit like a local authority housing. You know, you have to be fairly near the top of the housing list before we'll be able to accommodate you. Uh, and once we accommodate you, then you have a, you have a, you have a, a place to live for life. It's a permanent uh, place, uh, and you you have that for life, or for at least for as long as you as you want to have it. What if the person has mental health issues and addiction issues? Is there any conditions attached to the housing, and what kind of supports would they receive? Uh, the only conditions attached are they pay their rent, which is usually no problem because most of them would be on welfare and the rent is deducted at source before uh, they get it. Uh, and the other condition is they don't interfere with the neighbours. Uh, and that works. 80% of those that we house, even those with addiction or mental health problems, 80% are very successful. They maintain their accommodation. Now, maybe 20% don't and we have to put them out. But we don't put them on the street. We move them somewhere else. Yeah. And we find that the vast majority of those that didn't make it the first time, uh, when we move them to another accommodation, they make it the second time because they've learned from the first time what the mistakes that they've made and they don't make the same mistakes again. So 95% of those that we accommodate uh, keep their accommodation for life. Uh, even uh, maybe the second attempt uh, of accommodation, but they keep their accommodation for life. It's very successful. They also have a key worker, yeah. somebody who actually helps them do that. Yeah, the, the, the old policy for homelessness was if you have an addiction or a mental health problem or some other issues, go and solve your issues and then come back and we'll house you. Now that didn't work and it couldn't work. How can you address your addiction problem if you're living in a hostel full of drugs? How can you address your mental health problem if you're walking the streets all day with nowhere to go? So it didn't work. So now the policy is housing first. Give somebody, even with an addiction or a mental health problem, give them a place to live and then support them yeah. in addressing whatever problems they may have. So we'd have a support team who are available 24-7 and they will visit the person who's in the accommodation, might visit them once a week, might visit them once a day, but they're available on the phone 24 hours a day, and uh, they will uh, address whatever problems the person may be experiencing. They got one phone call at three o'clock in the morning from somebody says, can you help me? And they said, well, what's the problem? <laughs> There's a pigeon in my kitchen. <laughs> And they said, what the hell do you want us to do? <laughs> Open the windows. <laughs> 
But they're available 24-7 yeah. and they will come out if they have to or if they can deal with it over the phone, they will. Yeah. The support is the key thing. The support service, a very good support service uh, available at any time is the key to uh, those homeless people with addictions or mental health or other issues keeping their accommodation. Well, it makes sense, like, because, you know, if you look in the, at basic psychology, Maslow hierarchy needs, how can you address, you know, your uh, health and education? education, employment, if you don't know where you're going to be sleeping. Your basic needs have to be met before you can start addressing these other things. And it used to be backwards. Yeah. When you get sober and when you sort yourself out, we'll give you a house for sure. That was an impossible task, wasn't it? But I'm going to bring you back to the early 80s. Can you, like, you had the hostel for the young people, um, but then heroin hit. Can you describe the scene of what it was like and we unprepared for it and how did you manage it? Yeah, we hadn't a clue. Nobody had a clue. Heroin came in. A lot of people who are living pretty miserable lives, uh, people who are young people who are homeless, young people who had traumatic experiences in their childhood, uh, they started using heroin. And they thought it was the best thing ever invented. Nobody knew how addictive it was at that time. And nobody knew the health consequences, uh, like HIV, AIDS, or, or hepatitis C. So they all started using it, thought this was wonderful. And I would know whole families that were wiped out by AIDS. Every young person in the family died from AIDS. Sometimes the parents died from AIDS. Uh, they thought it was, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and then, of course, when they realized where this drug was leading them to, uh, they were addicted and they found it very, very difficult to, to, to deal with the addiction because the, the, there was virtually no uh, addiction services available back in the 80s. That only came much later. So they were stuck there with an addiction, no service that could uh, help them to address their addiction, and it just got worse and worse and worse. Yeah, just going back there um, to maybe when you're handing somebody the keys of their new apartment and you're there and you're the one handing them the keys and you see their feet, how does that feel? Oh, that's the, that's the real joy yeah. in the work that we do. <laughs> it's the real job satisfaction to see the smile on a fa the face of somebody who's walking into their apartment for the first time. It's like a dream come true. They can't believe it. Maybe they've been homeless and on the streets for years. And now suddenly they have an apartment. They say, I mean, this is all for me, they'll say, in disbelief. Here is now a place they can go in any time they want. They can make a cup of tea when they want. They can go to bed when they want. They can get up when they want. It's like, as I say, it's like a dream come true. And that is the real job satisfaction in the work yeah. that we do. And once they have the apartment and they know that they have it for life, that gives them the impetus to address their problems, yeah. whether it's addiction or mental health. And they're much more inclined to try and, and address those problems now that they have somewhere to, uh, to stay, nice. somewhere secure and somewhere very nice. <laughs> our apartments are top class. In fact, a lot of our staff are jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Some of our staff are living in private rented accommodation of yeah. much worse quality <laughs> and paying much higher rent than the homeless people who are in our apartments. How, how big is your organization at the moment? Have you much staff? It's grown, yeah. We have about seven, f 575 full-time staff. We had a budget last year of 54 million, of which we had to raise 12 million. Uh, so, and we deal with seven or 8,000 homeless people every year, uh, some providing accommodation, some providing drug treatment, some providing counselling, some providing advice to. Uh, so it's grown enormously. It's, 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 it's quite, it's, it's a At big At what point in your life did you realise that this is, this is what I'm here for? This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to look after people on the streets, homeless people who, uh, people in addiction, people in prison. I never plan more than a year ahead. <laughs> if uh, I've been doing this now for 43 years, 
if 43 years ago I had seen how this was going to develop, <laughs> I'd probably have turned around and run the other way. <laughs> yeah. It would have just been so frightening. Yeah. So luckily, I only saw one year ahead. I all, all I did was say, well, what do we have to do this year? What's the next need? So we just went from, from year to year uh, for about the first 25 years. Then about 18, 18 years ago, and I was 60 years of age then, we'd, I decided <clears throat> that this organization had to become independent of me because if I had died or fallen under a bus, the whole thing would have collapsed. So we employed a CEO who's been absolutely fantastic. He's been running the organization for the last 18 years, and he has expanded it to where it is today. So, as I say, I'm only the nameplate on the door now at this stage. But I still work a lot with homeless people, uh, you know, one-to-one, face-to-face. That's what I want to do. I don't want to, I don't want to be poring over financial records or worrying about the roof leaking. <laughs> uh, let him do all that. As I say, uh, if there's a problem at three o'clock in the morning, it's his phone that goes off now, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> so I'm delighted at that, you know. And it allows me to do what I want to do, which is working with homeless people directly. We spoke there about, uh, you know, when somebody has their basic needs met for the first time, it reminded me of, um, you know, when I went into detox, uh, it was True Merchants Key at the time. And I remember I had my own bed and my own wardrobe. I'd put my clothes away out of a bag, you know, for the first time and just lying down on the bed an overwhelming sense of safety and security. And then getting out and going into an aftercare house belonging to the Cork Simon community, having somewhere to go, getting the key worker, being supported. It's like, it's an overwhelming experience. But then all of a sudden, your standards start to, your standard of life starts to improve. And then you begin to think like stuff you thought was never there for you. Maybe education, maybe employment. Then you do a, a C scheme. And then you think maybe I can get a proper full time job. And then maybe I can be a manager. And people just progress in life, don't they? But it just starts with that, giving people an opportunity when they're at the lowest. I meet lots of people who have turned their lives around. They've uh, been in treatment or they've been in one of our places uh, and it's totally changed it's totally changed them uh, and it's wonderful to meet them maybe after a few years after they have uh, have left us uh, but as you say drug treatment is very difficult people look at drug users in the city center there and they say uh, why don't they stop taking drugs <laughs> it's not as simple as that at all many of them are taking drugs because of traumas they've experienced in childhood uh, either abuse or violence or extreme neglect uh, and they're using drugs to run away from their memories of childhood and to suppress the feelings that are associated with those painful memories <clears throat> and so when you go into drug treatment you have to stop running mm. You have to confront those memories and learn how to deal with them in a different way because those memories are never, ever going to go away. They're with you for the rest of your life. So drug treatment is yeah. extremely difficult. Uh, and it's a great credit to, to those who do manage uh, to come through drug treatment and come out the other end. Yes. People often give out to me about drug users. And, you know, uh, and I often wonder when a person's given out to me about drug, about drug users, I often wonder if they had a drug problem, would they be able to go through drug treatment? And I suspect they may not be able to. And yet many of these drug users are going through drug treatment. And they are doing what those who are criticizing them may not have been able to do themselves. Yeah. True. And you know what we have here today, Peter, um, we have somebody that you helped in the past. Friend and of they are going to come up to the stage and just talk about how uh, Peter McFerry Trust helped them yeah. and how you also on a personal level helped them. So yeah, Shani Kinsler. Shani Kinsler. Bye, Shani. <laughs> Where's the shot? Oh, Johnny, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> was a guest of ours. No, no. There you go. There you go. Oh, see. Right, lads. Shani, do you want to just give us a, a little bit around maybe your own story and how you first were introduced to Peter? Um... You know, I was sitting up the back up there and I was listening to I was listening to Hedge and I was kinda of thinking back 
Um, and I feel really privileged, feel really blessed to have met this man. Um, I feel blessed that I was encountered him when I was quite young and lost and hopeless and he reached out um, like he did to many people back then that I, that I was close with. And uh, yeah, he, he, he was just an, he was just somebody that that showed me kindness, showed me um, compassion. Showed me empathy and it oh. was just unbelievable. And what age were you when you first went in? So when I first started staying in the Hedges flat, so that was Peter's first flat, it was the Hedges flat, and uh, it was a three bedroom flat in the tower in Ballymun. And there was a handful of staff who worked there, and I was sleeping in the pipe box on the landing at the time. So there used to be a pipe box when you'd get out of the lift. Do you remember we used to stay in the pipe box? <laughs> 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 so we'd, like, we'd get a duvet out of the flat in the pillar. And the boys, like, it give me a cup of tea. And that was the flat that we obviously moved into then, um, not long after sleeping, because he wouldn't leave you sleeping in the pipe box for too long. How, how, how did it Should feel? Have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did it feel for you? Obviously, you, there was stuff going on in your own life at that stage. And uh, how did it feel for, just to have somebody in your life and uh, minding you, helping you, giving you a bit of time, and a bit of love and bring them into your home. Did that feel awkward for you? Because you probably weren't used to it at that time as well. Or was it something that you grasped with two hands and just went with it? You know, we've never, that's never, we've never got that, asked that question before. So that's, that's interesting. And it was, at that time in my life, I was, I was quite young to me, you know, I was, I was only a young lad, but I did, I was very, very damaged with Luke Peter talked about with trauma, I was very, my mental health wasn't in great shape and I was very scared and I was just very lucky that I had, you know, we had, we had heads and I had all the lads in the flat that were around me and some of the stuff we got up to was mental. <laughs> Certainly it was. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to explain what, 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 what Shani was like as a young kid or your earliest memories of Shani? Uh, Shawnee was never the worst. <laughs> Second worst, maybe. <laughs> no, Shawnee was always, he had, he had his problems, he had his addiction. Uh, and for a number of years, he'd be living out that addiction. We'd be fighting and arguing. And, uh, but Shawnee, fair juice to him, he, 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 over, he overcame that. And that's extremely difficult. But he did overcome it. He's now uh, drug free. He has his own place, uh, and he now works for us. So he's. Uh, this one is uh, Peter. Do you know when you see so many different people coming in and out of your organisation, the hostels and stuff, and you know, was there any? Was there ever a time that you said there's no hope for that fella? There's no hope. No, I, I've seen the most hopeless cases turn their lives around. I would never say there's no hope. I've seen young people who may be on drugs for a long, long time with an appalling history of childhood. You'd wonder how could they ever get over that? And I've seen them change their lives around. So there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Parents often ring me to, to say that their son or daughter they've discovered is using drugs and they really are scared to death and they're frightened. Uh, and what I have to do is tell them, look, there is life after drugs. <laughs> many, many drug users turn their lives around. It may take a while, it may take months, it may even take years. But many drug users do turn their lives around. Uh, and I want to know what's the relationship between the parents and the child who's using drugs. And if that relationship is a very good relationship and a very positive relationship, then that young person uh, has the foundation uh, which will help them to to deal with their addiction. It's the young people who don't have any family history or who have had an appalling family history, maybe abuse or violence at home, who have no relationship with their parents. They are the ones who are more difficult to help because that foundation uh, to allow them to address their, their, their traumas uh, doesn't exist. How do you deal with it on a personal level? You've seen so much trauma and pain on the streets, inside in the hostels, death, people dying. Like, how do you deal with that kind of stuff 
on a personal level, do you get some form of supervision? Do you have somebody that you talk to within uh, the church? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, I've been doing it for so long now. Uh, I do pray. I pray every morning for an hour if I can. Uh, I find that very, very helpful. It relaxes me. It it roots me in the day. Uh, so I do find that very, very, very helpful, uh, and that's probably my way of uh, of coping with with the traumas uh, that I've experienced in other people. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, 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 it. It uh, roots me. Yeah. Roots me. Uh, Does it just make you want to do more work and be more of more oh, yeah. of an advocate? Yeah, I want to. As long as I have the energy and the health to do it, I want to keep on doing what yeah. I'm doing. Mm. Uh, what keeps me going actually is anger. <laughs> I'm so angry. <laughs> <laughs> what are you angry about? I'm angry at the failure of our society to yeah. address uh, the problems of homelessness yeah. and and addiction. Uh, and I, I see I see people's lives. Uh, not being people not being able uh, to live a happy fulfilling adult life because our society does not provide them with the circumstances with the circumstances and services which they need uh, to do that so i'm angry all the time and that anger keeps you going you want to uh, uh, you want to help you want to help people uh, in the face of the absence of services adequate services uh, you know you you want to to help them. You know, anger, we often think of anger as something very negative, something to be avoided because it can often explode destructively. But anger is actually a very positive emotion. Anger and love go together. You cannot love somebody who is suffering unnecessarily without being angry at what's causing the suffering. And so I'm angry. And I always say when I lose my anger, I'll be no use to homeless people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shani, if you could if you could say anything to the young Shani that was homeless and bad on and drugs back in the day, what, what would you say to that, Sean? That's a good question. Um I was laughing when uh <clears throat> Well, I was laughing and I was kind of feeling really emotional when Timmy was looking at the picture of him when he was a baby, you know. And uh, for me, that's something that I do in my life a lot. Um, James, we have a young daughter now, Harper Lily. She's five. I just dropped her back to her mom today. And uh, she had breakfast with us this morning. That's right. Yeah, yeah. She was in the she was in the Herbert Park Hotel in Ballsbridge. Yeah. No. <laughs> Who was paying? <laughs> oh, he wasn't. Yeah, just to confirm it, we walked out without paying the bill. <laughs> well, we had breakfast this morning with the two lads, myself and the little one. I brought Harper and Lily on the camera at the Killarney Walk with the boys a couple of years back. They've been a, a great, they've been a great part of my recovery journey, and they've they've been amazing to me. So, but the 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 young Shawnee. I have realised what love means through Harper Lily. And when Harper Lily was born, I learned how to love young Shani. Mm. And basically, that's every time I see Harper Lily, I I see that, that, that young version of me. And I see that, that kind of loss, that trauma, the sadness, the bleeding, you know, the emptiness. And I just love her like I've never loved that. Isn't that lovely? That's beautiful, yeah. And that's very important what Shani said there about um, looking at your young self. And I did get more still uh, looking yeah. at myself because I do meditation a lot around healing the young child. You know, going back to the young part of my life when there was traumatic ev events happening in my life. And I go back there, that child, and I try to help that child to process that trauma that happened back then. You know, so I can bring them on because I'm not just helping that child and helping me, this adult today. Because them, as we were talking earlier on about core beliefs, all my beliefs were, were came from back then. And that's why I go back. And when I we used to go back to meet that child in meditation, you know, I used to be kicked, punched, pushed. 
you know, swear that, all these different things, you know, and I just kept going back to that meditation. I, I found a picture at home and I visualized that child and that was one of the pictures. And I kept going back and back and back and slowly and slowly by surely, this child started to come closer to me, started to come closer. I, I was getting a hug for the first time and I was helping that child to process stuff in the know that they could never ever process back then because they didn't have the ability up here and they didn't have the people inside in their environment either. So it's very important that if you're struggling with sh shit today and that's what it is, right? Maybe you need to go back and start healing that young child. Maybe go back there and help that child process the stuff that they couldn't process back then. And that's how I started to heal. And I also left myself be vulnerable and feel the stuff that was going on for me inside my body. And the stuff in the head means nothing. They're all devices, just all the negative stuff, the belief systems that we have since we're kids. They'll always want to take control of what's going on in the head and just make you feel like shit. But if you can become aware through mindfulness meditation about this stuff and just sit and feel it, it's, it's the game changer. Your life will change. And, and that's what happened for me. But I do still go back to that inner child work and, and just try to help that child every opportunity I can. What do you think, Peter? Thank you. You mentioned earlier on, Peter, about uh, since you started, you know, we've gone from 1,000 homeless to over 12,000, and that, you know, people could say that you're a failure, but you're after helping Shawnee and a lot of others to thrive in their life, to go back into their communities, to help others, to raise their kids. So, listen, there's a huge amount of credit here. It's an honour to share, share the stage with you. And I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Pleasure. Thank you're you very welcome. much indeed. Thank you too. Yeah, uh, and Shawnee. And Shawnee as well, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter.